a registered nurse for 20 years. Um, so I have been doing this job for a really long time. One of my passions over the years has always been patient education, which is why I've created this YouTube channel as an opportunity to, find, to provide um, basic information about women's health to healthcare consumers. Um, I have also spent a lot of time at precepting both nurse practitioner as well as physician assistant students. I love working with students and one of the things that I have found is that they really do uh, like to get uh, clip note versions of what to talk to the patients about. This is not about pathophysiology. They get, the students get plenty of pathophys in, in class. This is more about the actual nuts and bolts of talking to patients. So today we're going to focus on polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS. So whenever I have somebody that comes in that thinks that they have, um, that want to know more about polycystic ovarian syndrome, first thing you got to do is break it down. What does polycystic ovarian syndrome mean? Poly, as we know, is the Latin word for many. Cystic, cis, ovarian, in the ovaries, syndrome, multi-system involved. Um, so PCOS is actually really common, um, especially if you're working in the, in the gynecological uh, clinic setting, you will see that quite often. Depending on what source you go to, some places will say 5 to 10 percent of the population, some say up to 15 percent of the population um, are affected by PCOS within the childbearing years. Um, there is a genetic component. We're finding more and more that women whose moms had PCOS or whose sisters have PCOS will also have it. There's obviously going to be a, a, an association with uh, obesity. And I don't know about you, but I know within my practice, I have a, the vast majority of my patients are overweight or obese, so we do see a fair amount of, of PCOS. So how do you diagnose PCOS? The generally recognized standard is um, what's called the Rotterdam criteria. Within the Rotterdam criteria, the patient, if they meet two out of three of the criteria, then they test in for uh, PCOS. The first one's going to be irregular infrequent menstrual cycles. These women do not ovulate on a regular basis. Um, little moment of shameless self-promotion, if you want to have your patients watch my video on um, my uh, periods of blessing and a curse, I talk about how normal menstruation happens. For women who have polycystic ovarian syndrome, rather those follicles don't ever reach maturity, so the patients don't ovulate. And as we know, ovulation is what brings on menstruation. So these women will get a collection of these immature follicles within their ovaries. And these um, ovaries, these ovarian cysts, will actually throw off hormone levels, which can, um, again, cause a lot of different um, systemic uh, side effects. Um, they will often uh, have physical manifestations, such as um, acne that is recalcitrant to treatment or that extends past adolescence into, into adulthood. They'll have hair in places that girls don't typically have hair, and a lot of times that is, that is a, system, a symptom that will bring them to the doctor is, you know, what's up with this, my facial hair, or I've got hair on my chest or on my abdomen that, that doesn't look quite right. Some of these women will come in and they have, they're having a hard time getting pregnant. Um, they've, been, they've been trying for six months and nothing is happening and this is a lot of times that's when we find out that they actually have polycystic ovarian syndrome. A lot of these patients will also be obese. Estimated somewhere between 40 to 80 percent of women with PCOS um, also have obesity. You can still have obese and be of a normal BMI, but um, your, your Scooby sense should just definitely be raised if you have somebody who has irregular menstrual cycles and an elevated BMI. Um, the third criteria is going to be multiple peripheral follicles on ultrasound. So when you do an ultrasound, again, these, uh, these um, cysts that are backing up in the ovaries are going to create um, what looks what we call a string of pearls. They, the cysts go around the, the periphery of the ovaries, um, and there's anywhere typically between four and nine um, follicles, and that is diagnostic of polycystic ovaries. Now, keep in mind, you can have polycystic ovaries and not have polycystic ovarian syndrome. 
You can also have polycystic ovarian syndrome and not have polycystic ovaries. If your patient comes in and they have oligomenorrhea, that very you know ir irregular, infrequent menstrual cycles, along with um, the uh, physical manifestations, then they test in with even without having an ultrasound. So your patient has presented to the clinic and they are concerned about um, their lack of menstrual cycles, their inability to get pregnant, their, their um, acne, their hirsutism. So what are you going to do? As a provider, you're going to get a good history, of course. Um, you want to find out um, the family history. Did their mom have PCOS? Do they have, do their sisters have PCOS? Um, when did they start menstruating and when did they notice a change in their menstrual cycles? A lot of these girls started having irregular cycles in adolescence and were put on birth control pills. Then they come off of the birth control pills and then they can't get pregnant and, and they haven't had a menstrual cycle in four months. Um, how, what is the longest period of time that you've gone without a menstrual cycle? That is, um, you know, sometimes patients think that it's a great thing that they haven't menstruated in three to six months and that is something to be concerned about. Have they had any recent weight changes? Mostly weight gain. You'll see a lot of um, a pretty rapid weight gain with patients who have polycystic ovarian syndrome. Is your patient sexually active? What does your patient do to prevent pregnancy? I usually steer clear of the question, what do you use for birth control? Because for patients who have either had their tubes tied or their spouse has had a vasectomy, or these patients are in a same-sex relationship, they will respond, I don't, I don't use anything for birth control, not, under, not understanding the question. Um, so I usually just ask, how do you prevent pregnancy? You can do a physical exam. You definitely want to get a height and a weight. You want to calculate their BMI. Um, you can uh, look and see if you can find abnormal hair growth. You can look and see does the patient have acne primarily on their chest, on their back, on their face? Um, if, they, if the patient is due for cervical cancer screening, I highly recommend you do that. Just to want to take the uh, possibility of um, cervical cancer off the table for the abnormal uterine bleeding. So you're going to start your diagnostic workup, and of course you want to think of all of your differential diagnoses. As we know, the menstrual cycle is not just ovaries. Your pituitary gland, your adrenals, your thyroid, um, as well as the ovaries all have an effect on the menstrual cycle. So the preliminary lab work, you're going to want to rule all of those out. You're going to want to definitely do a prolactin level. Do a, do a pregnancy test. I've had patients who've come in who couldn't understand why they didn't have their period, and um, we're sure that they couldn't get pregnant, and, and lo and behold, they were pregnant. Um, you want to check uh, thyroid, and if you are concerned at all about uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, um, can, uh, CAH can mimic PCOS. You can have the irregular menstrual cycles. You can have the cysts on your ovaries. Um, you can certainly have the physical manifestations, but CAH is a different diagnosis than PCOS and it can have long-term ramifications. So when you're doing your preliminary lab work, um, if you, of course you want to do, um, if you're concerned if the, about the patient, um, if they have a lot of uh, uh, hirsutism, you want to add a testosterone level. We I recommend total, not free testosterone. Total gives us more information. Um, you definitely want to check a DHEAS. Um, if you're concerned about adrenal hyperplasia, 17-OH progesterone, um, and that test does need to do, be done first thing in the morning. If your patient is um, having infertility issues and is um, having irregular menstrual cycles, but doesn't seem to demonstrate any of the physical manifestations, and you want to get a you want to get an ultrasound, not a bad idea to take a look at those ovaries and see if you have, in fact, some of these adrenal hyperplasia, or the some of these peripheral follicles on the ovaries. Um, when these patients are, if you have tested them in for uh, PCOS probably want to get um, some kind of an oral glucose tolerance test um, to rule out prediabetes and or diabetes. You want to do a sleep apnea questionnaire. Um, screen them for depression and anxiety. A lot of these patients will have sexual dysfunction as well. Some of them will have eating disorders. They are frustrated because they can't lose weight and they will resort to extremes such as bulimia or anorexia. So keep in mind those are some potential differential diagnoses that you need to take a look at. 
If your patient is over the age of 35 and has gone a long period of time without a menstrual cycle, or she is morbidly obese and has gone long periods of without a menstrual cycle, you also want to be aware of the potential for endometrial hyperplasia, where the inside of the uterus gets overdeveloped. Oh, endometrial hyperplasia over time can lead to uh, endometrial cancer. So with those patients, I will usually recommend doing an endometrial biopsy. We bring them in, we put a speculum in, we take a tube, we go up into the uterus, withdraw these cells, and send them off for pathology to make sure that the, that the patient does not have the beginnings of endometrial cancer. So your patient has been, you've made the diagnosis and you have, um, the, ta the patient has tested in for uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome. So what are your treatment plans? Um, basically, your treatment plans are going to depend on the patient's future fertility desires. If the patient does not desire fertility, um, you are going to want to um, talk about cycle control. You do want these women to menstruate, whether it's once a month or every three months. Um, you can do that with birth control pills. The nice thing about birth control pills is some of them will have an anti-androgenic effect. Uh, Desinogestrel is one of my go-tos with my patients with PCOS. The, um, these patients, the desinogestrel will not get rid of the unwanted hair, but it can definitely slow down the progress of unwanted hair growth. It can also provide good um, reliable contraception for these women as well as it can protect that uterine lining. Some patients just want to do a LARC, a progesterone only like a Depo or Nexpanon or a Mirena. Those products are great for protecting the uterine lining. They are also great for providing birth control. However, they do not help with symptoms such as hirsutism or acne. Um, for those patients that want to use a LARC but don't want and you know and, and still need to have their acne or their hirsutism managed, um, you can use an anti-androgenic medication such as spironolactone. Um, for those patients that have unwanted hair growth, you can also recommend hair treatments, um, laser hair removal, depilatories, those kind of things can help. Some people believe that if, you, that if you shave or if you wax, the hair grows back in thicker and more coarse, and that, that, that's not true. The, the hair is what it is. Um, so if your patient does desire pregnancy, you definitely want to talk to them about weight management. Um, all patients who have PCOS, I, I, you do want to you want to you want to address weight management. And for a lot of providers, that's kind of an uncomfortable conversation to have. I will usually tell my patients who come in who are obese, if you can lose five to ten percent of your weight, understanding it is very hard, but through a good healthy diet that includes fruits and vegetables and whole grains and lean meats and lots and lots of water and regular exercise, they can in fact get their weight down to a healthy level. Ideally, you want their weight down to a healthy level um, prior to pregnancy, not only to uh, decrease their risk for developing diabetes and heart disease, um, but it also helps with those patients who have some sleep apnea. Also, if patients are depressed, it can help, um, it can help decrease some of their depression symptoms. If your patient does want to get pregnant and is um, has got PCOS, um, you, they, you need to let them know that they can still get pregnant. Uh, PCOS decreases fertility but does not eliminate it. That being said, if a patient has documented PCOS and has had no fertility after six to 12 months, depending on their age and their situation, I will usually refer them to um, either an OB or a reproductive endocrinologist for further evaluation and treatment. Um, for those patients that are just not ovulating, no matter what you do, um, we used to give them metformin. Metformin is great for uh, decreasing the risk for prediabetes and diabetes. However, studies are showing that it really doesn't do anything to improve um, ovulation. If you want the patient to ovulate, typically Clomid is going to be your first line of defense. Clomid will um, provide about 80% of patients who take Clomid will ovulate and about 50% of those will achieve a pregnancy. There's also Letrozole is a medication that is used for treatments of breast cancer. It does not have the indication for infertility. However, they're finding that letrozole can increase your, um, increase your fertility by increasing ovulation uh, chances. 
Now, with these ovulation triggers, they do increase the risk for multiples, so some providers prefer to steer clear of those. As a mid-level provider, as a nurse practitioner, those are medications that I do not prescribe. I leave that up to the physicians um, in my practice to do that. Um, for patients who don't want to take the risk of multiples or for providers who are relatively um, concerned about that, uh, those patients we will usually send to REI and they can talk about in vitro fertilization. IVF is becoming more and more common and it is, it's got a pretty high success rate for creating a pregnancy. So once your patient is pregnant, um, they are at increased risk for developing gestational diabetes. So patients who have a history of PCOS, I will usually order an early glucose tolerance test um, in pregnancy. And because they're at increased risk for cardiovascular disease, I will also put them on a low dose aspirin typically right around 12 weeks. I'll also get some baseline labs if they're obese um, or if they do have a history of any kind of high blood pressure. These patients are going to be at increased risk for C-sections if they are not able to manage their weight appropriately or if they have uncontrolled um, blood sugars throughout their pregnancy. So a lot of times I will just go ahead and see if they want to do a nutritional consult to optimize their nutrition during pregnancy. After these patients have their babies, uh, they come into their postpartum visit, and I can't tell you how many have told me that they don't need birth control because they were an infertility patient. And I always like to explain to them that the, having a baby is like rebooting your system on your computer. After you have a baby, those ovaries, for whatever reason, may go right back to normal function, and they can return to fertility immediately. Um, so that's all I have about polycystic ovarian syndrome for you, the clinician. If you have any questions about anything that has been presented today, I will leave my email address um, in the comment section of this video. Please feel free to reach out to me either via email through Instagram, Facebook. Um, my account there is CJCEE. J-A-Y-W-H-N-P. If you have found these videos to be at all helpful in your practice, if you feel as though they would benefit, you have your patients would benefit, please feel free to subscribe, share, like, whatever you feel compelled to do. Um, that's all I have for today. This is CJ at your service.